Uh, ten minutes a person. Uh, we basically unplug you at ten minutes. That's okay. We run a little late. We run a little early. We'll love you. It's fine. Um, so I want to talk real quickly about this idea of chaos. Uh, <laughs> chaos really interests me. Um, and while I talk about my display being chaotic, uh, I will explain the idea here. So in the last couple of talks, we've done a lot of things uh, on my team, especially with benchmarking and performance measuring. It's really interesting when you take something like Juju and you can model uh, how its apologies deployed and managed. The idea of benchmarking becomes this repeatable measure that you can just throw at, um, at, at a service. So I can do things like PG Bench could just be a charm I deploy and relate, and I can then use actions to initiate benchmarking. If I have a giant big data stack, I can use things like TerraSort to be that measure of performance in my cluster. And when I tweak and tune things, and then I can benchmark again, I can start getting these results because I have that repeatable model that explains everything for me. Um, but the other side of that is that benchmarking performance is great. It's something that I think, just like testing, everyone strives to do benchmarking. But with all the work we have to do and all the things and requirements changing, testing is like one of those things that never really gets done. I feel like benchmarking is in that same vein. Like, I just got my stack running. I think maybe we worry about performance now. I don't have time for that. Um, in that same vein, what I think is really something that is hard to do and that is easy to punt on in development teams is chaos. Production is chaos, especially production in the clouds. Talk about transient natures. Cloud instances can just go away one day. Amazon can suddenly just be down in an entire region or any cloud provider. Even bare metal suffers that same problem. Unless you have an operations and infrastructures team that has redundancy <coughs> for redundancies for redundancies, eventually something is going to be unplugged somewhere. Whether it's me tripping over a network cable in a data center, or it's an entire flood storm to your East Coast data center that ends up knocking out uh, all the power for an entire uh, region of the United States. And so what's interesting to me, especially with the model, this is a theoretical playing talk. I don't like that. I'm sorry. But something I've been playing with recently is the idea of chaos. How can I, using the Juju model, impact chaos into my production workload or a workload and measure how resilient my software actually is? And something that I found really interesting with Juju is just the way we bottle benchmarks. Uh, we have benchmark, benchmark UA. I gave a talk on it earlier. It's kind of a cool thing. Check the video out. I'm not going to go into it because I have time. But if, what if I can do that same idea for chaos? What if I could take something? and model all the ideas that are chaotic in production. Things like network latency. Something you could never really predict to happen, but what if I could reliably impact a node, a service, or an entire AZ to have network latency all of a sudden? And then measure, whether using performance or something else, how well my application is resilient to that idea. What if I just suddenly made a service disappear? What happens if an entire service, Memcache, just goes away in my web stack? How well does my application handle that resilience? What happens when even a single node just blinks out? And then what happens all together when the, the tool I'm using to model this suddenly goes away? What happens if Juju just stopped working one day? How well is my application resilient? Or rather, how resilient is the, is the modeling tool I'm using to these kind of things? So something I've been trying and toying with that I wanted to have a demo for, but I didn't quite get there um, for this lightning talk, is the idea of chaos. What if I could just Juju deploy chaos related to some things and impact just mayhem upon my cluster. And what if I could adopt those principles that Netflix does? They have famously published the idea of Chaos Monkey, Simeon Army, and all these other things. You have a question? Just hold it yeah, the eye. Uh, oh, thanks. I was like, good questions. This is a lightning talk. <laughs> but Simeon Army is something that Netflix has published open source, and I think it's a great idea. I like it. They run this in production. They have the 9,000 pound gorilla that just turns off an entire region of their cloud in production to see how resilient their application is. And by keeping their developers on their toes, they ensure their application will be able to su survive any of these weird right. things. So be I've been trying really hard to figure out how do I model chaos? <laughs> and I'm getting pretty close and I'm really excited about the idea. And I think for a talk sometime this year, I may submit what it means to model chaos. But for now, if anyone's interested in what it means to suddenly make things disappear and how you program reactively to that, I'm really interested in talking to you. I'm Marco Ceppi, if you didn't know, and I want to deploy chaos. Yeah. You! All right. Uh, we're skipping number three for now. Uh, Beanie, you're up next, so make sure you queue up, please. You're up next, trust me. Number three is moved to the very end because they've got a demo of the property. Oh, so, 
make sure you kind of make, work your way up here. So next, with time to spare, hopefully, uh, Charles Butler, the title OGTLS. Said you just want to sit oh. next to him or something. Yeah, totally. Are you a VGA? HDMI? Every time uh, something from Ubuntu is called, they have to pay the Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's your model. Yeah, yeah. they changed to it though. Cool. After the SSL problem came, you know when the SSL? Yes. And then somebody, everyone right. needs support. Uh, hi, the I would like your attention to talk about, oh my god, TLS. So I want you to consider the following. When you deploy services, typically we're not thinking about necessarily what's going over the wire until much later in the application lifecycle. And that means that TLS often becomes an afterthought. So you see here you've got client to cluster communication, you have peer communication inside that cluster that's unencrypted, as well as communication between two charms. So consider the following, if you had a easy way to implement TLS between client to cluster, cluster uh, peer to peer in the cluster, as well as charm to charm. So we're looking to make this easy and we actually wrapped all of this up into a nice consumable layer. <coughs> And the way that it works is every charm that gets deployed has a leader. And this leader is kind of a special role for us in this case with this layer because this leader generates a CA certificate unless you, unless you uh, provide it one. It also generates a certificate for any service that's spinning up on this unit. And it signs incoming CSRs to its peers. This, this particular unit is also responsible for coordinating sending back certificates after it's received these certificate signing requests. So if you're a follower participating in this cluster, it's just going to receive the certificate authority from the leader. It's going to import this into the local key ring so that way you can use self-signed PKI. And it also generates a self, uh, certificate signing request to send to the leader. So if you want to include this in your charm, you can do this today just by including layer TLS. That's all you have to do. For your particular charm code to consume that, you just import unit data from charm helpers and you subscribe to the event when the signed certificate is available. You can now pull that certificate right out of unit data. And this is the, uh, Matt, is this a file path or is this the contents? It's the contents of the certificate. So you can write this out, you can consume it, whatever the case may be for your use case with TLS. And if you want secure communication, this is how you get secure communication. So we welcome all feedback, bugs, and pull requests to our GitHub repository. If you're interested in the upstream development, it's on github.com slash mbrujek slash layer TLS. And that's all I have. Oh, these are turned into a net talks real quickly. Um, JV's up with benchmarking web applications. Mm -hmm. After that is Saman Saeed. Make your way on up. Too much work. So again, just so you all know, you have, you have 10 minutes. You don't have to fill it, though. And I'll be giving you five and three and one minute warnings, and I'll be running over and yanking the cord out of your laptop. Are you ready? Okay. He said, So you go next. I told him I was going to see you. Oh, if you're ready, you'll be after some more. Also, while this one gets set up, because we have one more minute before this one's supposed to start, font size is a thing that can be increased and should, unless you're using a tiling window manager. <laughs> um, make sure you got those ready for your demos if you're doing demos. It makes it much easier to read the screen. This looks good. Before it starts, uh, this is uh, Dark Horse Comics where James works, and they run on Juju and OpenStack, so it's like a cool kind of thing. So you can support them by buying your favorite comic books from Dark Horse. That's my commercial. <laughs> no, was that a GG commercial also, or a dark horse commercial? A little bit of both. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, pay no attention to the fact that this is New Relic. This could be any monitoring service. Uh, just so happens that we outsource our monitoring because we have a lot of instances. And uh, it's not something we want to do ourselves. So uh, I'm James Beattie. I work at Dark Horse Comics as a cloud engineer. And uh, we deploy Ubuntu OpenStack and Ubuntu everything else, which is really cool. It allows us to keep consistency across uh, our entire infrastructure stack and uh, allows uh, management and uh, the administration of our uh, services a snap. <laughs> uh, so what I want to show is, well, 
how I am going about benchmarking our web applications. We have a group of different web applications and, uh, well, no one really knew how to benchmark them, so we decided to start looking into that and uh, it's uh, something that definitely can be, take advantage of the charm benchmarking functionality. And so, while I'm not using it in this demonstration, that's something that this will be moving towards in the near future. I probably will be implementing this very similar benchmarking techniques, but using Charm Benchmark because that's well, what it's for. Um, so, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, kick off a benchmark on one of our web applications, and I'll let you all kind of... Uh, See what I see when I benchmark web applications looking for a ceiling or possibly uh, points of contention when certain services become uh, too heavily under load. So uh, the structure of our, uh, this application is fairly basic. We have HA proxy at the top level that uh, proxies to a cluster of different web applications that uh, are servers that just host our Django code basically. And, uh, then our apps are decoupled in the sense that we have different memcache hosts and different database hosts, of course, and decoupled as you, as you can make it. Uh, so it's very hard to know what parts, which services incorporated in our web applications will start to fail when the application is under load uh, due to the fact that there's so many moving pieces. And uh, so this is kind of what I'm doing to help identify some of those uh, points in our application. So uh, what I'm going to do basically is just pull up a three basic servers. I've got a uh, Postgres dev instance here. Let's see if I can't make this any larger. Problem with GUIs, right? Um, so right now we can see the Postgres servers I basically idling, very little CPU, very little memory usage, and the rest of the application stack should look very similar. Because, well, it's not under any load right now, uh, given this is a, a staging environment. API servers, salary instances, Elastic Search, HA Proxy, Memcache, Flux, and so on. So I'll go ahead and pull up uh, App 37 just to get a good app representation. out and I define multiple tasks in my Locus file that allow me to hit those endpoints asynchronously. So I'll go ahead and run, just kick off the uh, Locus load testing application. And as you can see here, I'm pointing Locus at and uh, FPDN is digital staging dot dark horse, but really that's a FPDN that points to our HA proxy. So when I kick off this load test, oh, my bad. Excuse me. Uh, Locus will provide us a web interface we can access at port 8089 on whichever post we write on. So uh running it on post player host eighty eighty nine. And we we see here we're presented with an interface where we can define a number of users to simulate. 
and a, a hat rate, which is basically the amount of the operations that that user will be performing. So here, I want 100 users that are uh, performing 10 Git requests, my web application endpoints, per second. So this is a really good baseline that uh, I usually start off at. And we can kick off the load test here, and we can see it's starting to uh, perform our Git requests to these different API endpoints. And so momentarily, we should start to be able to see the different parts of the application that are affected by this load. Um, There's even many other ways you can monitor this. Of course, like I said, please don't pay any attention to the fact that these new realm just makes it easy. We don't have to manage the uh, monitoring infrastructure as well. Uh, momentarily, we should start to see the load increase. And also on our web app, uh, we should start to see the load increase. So, the question while you wait. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Do you use the new relic subordinate charm also to get the agent onto all your machines, or do you do that via other means? Just out of curiosity. So, um, so that's a really good point. Like, I would really, I would definitely take advantage of that. I'm currently in the process of converting all of our web applications to be Juju deployed. Okay. Um, there's a interesting problem that's arisen in our infrastructure because what predates me is. Uh, a heavy puppet, heavy puppet infrastructure at Dark Horse. So a lot of my job there has been looking at how the app is set up and deployed with Puppet and what I can do to make small modifications to get the same thing done with Juju, basically. Um, so at that point's coming very soon, and when that happens, yes, we will be taking advantage of the new raw plugin. But um, looks like it's possibly just lagging a little bit on reporting. So I will. Uh, so what's really interesting though, because we just, we're monitoring our web application performance here, but what's also really important to us is the uh, resources that are being used by our actual stack that uh, is underneath these web applications. So in the same in the same time frame, in the same operation that I'm using to benchmark our benchmark our web applications we can very easily also be benchmarking our, our cloud that's underneath those and monitoring those statistics as well when they decide to load. So if I just were to, let's say, SSH into one of these app servers. Okay, so we, we can see we're using uh, right over a, a gig of memory at this point, and we can see the different uh, processes that have been spawned to facilitate the load that the web application is being placed under. So hopefully at this point, we should should be able to start seeing some load in the relic. And as we can see here, our right. network load is starting to rise. And uh, unfortunately, this is not a uh, streamlined demonstration because our data is not loaded that. I mean, but over the course of, if I were to let this run for five or 10 minutes, their data would start to aggregate into the uh, GUI here where I'd be able to get a good visual on it. And then, if I had, let's say, all 20 different parts of our web application up and different screens and different monitors, which is really annoying, and something that I also don't need to do, which is where Charm Benchmarking will really help uh, facilitate 
not even needing the GUI anymore because I'll be able to benchmark these applications and be able to get a set of results back that uh, won't take this kind of introspection. Zero minutes. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, we didn't really get to see uh, the results of the. Uh, it's going up right here, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's how I'm taking the bench. There, there's yeah, more back. Yeah, that's. You know. Sorry, new relic. No. Joys of live demo. Not keeping up, buddy. No, just scroll okay, down. So, scroll down. See yeah. the network I.O.? Yeah, it's going. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's working. So, yeah, and, and if we had more time, then basically we would look at the fact that our web app, okay, even at the load that we're placing it under, isn't under that much, isn't really under that much load. But um, if it were, which it usually would max out far before the database load just because of the type of processes that are running the web application server. I could then choose to scale my web app servers out and maybe my memcache servers out until I see, until I can find a ceiling on my database server, right? And so, uh, yeah, that's how I'm benchmarking our web applications. And uh, again, I'm James Media from Dark Horse Comics. Thank you so much for your time. All right, next up, we've got Saban Saeed. We talked about cloud leader reports. Everyone shifts down, or shifts there. Put yourself in. Um, awesome. So we'll get plugged in. Again, generic reminder, screen sizes, demos, terminals, increasing font sizes and things still. This looks good. And Merlin, you're going to go last time? Okay, cool. Uh, my name is Samaz Ed, and I'm going to talk about a tool called uh, Cloud Weather Report. So, um, you develop the charm, you add a sense test to your charm, and you also added a benchmark. You probably tested this charm on your local machine. And now you're thinking about, does this charm work on the clouds? that uh, Juju supports. And, you know, does it work on AWS, GCE, or Joint, and all other clouds that uh, Juju supports. In order to do this, you can manually test your, uh, your, uh, your charm on each of the cloud. In order to do this, you do it for each cloud, you deploy the bundle, you run the test, and you run the benchmark. So what the cloud weather report does is, it simplifies this process for you. That's nice. That's a nice good idea. So Cloud Weather Reports <coughs> enables charm authors and uh, people who maintain it to run pulse check and benchmarks on multiple clouds. I'm going to show. Um, so in order to install it, you just do a pip and install Cloud Weather Report. Once you That's do this, nice. you get a command called CWR. And CWR followed by your controller names. In this case, we have AWS GCE join, and we have a test plan .yaml file. That's nice. The test plan <laughs> contains the bundle you want to deploy and a benchmark you want it to run. In this case, we deploy this uh, big data uh, bundle, and we're running a benchmark called TerraSource. Once you do this, you get a nice output locally, something like this. On the top, you see your model, and on the second row, you see your test passed on AWS, GCE, join. On the, left, on the right side, you see your benchmark data, which is, you can see that uh, to run GCE Terrasor, uh, in Terrasor, uh, um, is running a little bit faster on GCE, followed by joint on the top is AWS. And on the bottom, you see your report history if all your tests are passing and, uh, or failing. And all this is running, uh, the test result is output on your local machine. Nice. nice. If you want more info, um, it's on the GitHub on Juju Solution, and it's on the Cloud Weather Report. Cool.
Mm -hmm. So up next. Good idea, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Touch one? Yes. Awesome. Talk about the Azure Resource Manager, on deck, Merlin. And we have one more late entry. As a reminder, if you have demos, push font size, I'll be giving you time warnings, 5310X. Hello everyone, my name is Marcelo Asari, I'm a cloud engineer working for Cloud Based Solutions. Uh, just a bit of background, we're mostly the guys who do a lot of the Windows integration in this, these big uh, open source projects, so we're behind Windows support in OpenStack and uh, in Juju. And today I'm here to talk about a little bit off topic about uh, the Asia, Asia Resource Manager API which is uh, a, new, a new way of interacting with Azure that Microsoft folks rolled out last year. Uh, just a bit of background on why you the hell you should be listening to me. Uh, I've worked for half of my career on Azure Core, and uh, for the other half I've worked uh, using, so, so using the, the ARM API in various, various projects. Uh, I just want to know the fact that Juju has set up support to track the public. Uh, so, you might be saying a full story on my part, so clearly I'm here to have a skill kit or something. And uh, indeed I am. And uh, mostly it's going to be along the lines of the sales pitches you see during the shopping in the sense that uh, I come here with a very, very average product and compare it to a very, very bad one. And it seems amazing and we're all happy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the, 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 bad, the bad side of the story. Azure Zold API, the Azure Service Management API. Uh, just a quick note, I shamelessly stole all these diagrams from a YouTube video made by a Microsoft MVP. You should totally check them out. Uh, they're really nice, it explains a lot of these stuff. Uh, so the Azure Service Management API came out uh, in about 2009, and uh, back then it was clearly bleeding edge. It allowed you to do a lot of stuff. Uh, it focused around uh, this diagram, which is meant to show a cloud service. In, uh, in this, so a cloud service contains uh, multiple virtual machines and uh, multiple interfaces, and uh, you can hot swap virtual machines, change them. Uh, the cloud service takes care that they're all to scale and all those all those nice stuff. Uh, it has it had uh, awesome strengths back in its time. Uh, it was a REST API. Uh, it sent XML to HTTPS. Um, it was. It, has a, it had a very platform as a service feel to it in the sense that uh, you'd go on Azure to deploy an instance and it kept shoving uh, pre-baked pre images with Drupal or other stuff down your throat. And uh, it, w it was nice because it simplified a lot of trivial repetitive tasks back in 2009. Uh, the simplest example being after you set up a VM, you have, to, you have to make all the firewall rules and the port forwarding to SSH or RTP into it, depending on it, whether it's a Linux or a Windows machine and you had to handle all those kinds of stuff by yourself, which was pretty bad. Uh, the uh, service management API uh, totally took care of it, and uh, you could you could think of a cloud service as being self-contained, and it takes care of itself for the most part. Uh, but it did have some pretty pretty bad shortcomings. So uh, cloud services aren't opt out. So if you want to deploy an instance, it has to be in a cloud service in the old API. And uh, the old API, so the maximum granularity, if you will, of a, of a thing you were deploying was a single resource. You could not deploy more than one thing at the same time. It meant that uh, you had to make sure of a lot of stuff, uh, make sure that everything was going in the right order, and uh, you had to take care of that yourself. And uh, generally, everything alongside the cloud, the uh, cloud service felt like sort of a second class resource. So you'd focus on your cloud services, and then you had virtual networks that connected cloud services, you have storage services that provided storage for cloud services, and everybody loves cloud services. But um, the cloud services model had a huge problem. Uh, I'm not trying to bash on the Microsoft engineers, I'm sure uh, they had very valid technical reasons, but uh, basically during, concur during concurrent updates on components of a cloud service was very, very hazardous to the point that uh, they actually did not provide the possibility to do so in the API. In some cases, I'll just read that out for you in case you can see it. So right now, the only operations on virtual networks on a subscription are set virtual network configuration and get virtual network configuration. What this meant is that uh, you, in order to manage networking resources from a virtual network to the absolute smallest thing like a DNS entry, you'd query Azure for 
all the network configuration of your subscription. I need to see the networks of your coworkers, your boss, everything. Uh, you you get that. You modify you modify that data structure in whichever way you need it, and then you send it back. And H Azure would do the would do the diff and do the paste there. Uh, of course, this is extremely, extremely bad for concurrency. You can imagine if you have two things doing networking operations at the same time, they both fetch the configuration, both of them update it in the same way, and the second one who arrives there is the one who gets patched over the first one who arrives there. Uh, so, it clearly, it, it, was, it was pretty bad. Um, I would argue that in those times, Azure's biggest feature by far was the fact that Visual Studio had a deploy to Azure button. Uh, that, was, uh, that was mostly what the Microsoft folks were going for back at the time, so the passive view, the platform as a service view of things. But uh, times have changed and people want infrastructure. So that's why uh, the Azure, Azure Resource Manager API came out. Uh, some advantages to it. Uh, it, now, it now works on JSON payloads. You, you'll see that this actually is handy for us later. Uh, all resources are now first class. So. Uh, all resources are equally important in their point of view. There's no longer that cloud service centric point of view. And uh, you can now deploy resources in groups, which was really nice. And uh, some other niceties, it, uh, you could still deploy uh, old ASM style resources, but uh, they were completely incompatible. So uh, you could not attach an ARM virtual network to an ASM instance in a cloud service or vice versa, that kind of stuff. Uh, because uh, because it worked at a, at a resource level and, and, and got away with cloud services, uh, it was truly restful in the sense that you, you didn't have that, those concurrency problems uh, within the API. And you could deploy ARM templates, which uh, looks like this. Uh, <coughs> an ARM template gets directly translated to an ARM resource group. Uh, it, if you're familiar with heat templates or cloud formation templates, uh, Terraform files basically are the same thing, only for Azure. This is the syntax for it. Uh, and uh, another really nice thing the, the guys put through for the next API is that, uh, for this API is that uh, they wrote Swagger. Is anyone familiar with Swagger? Uh, yeah. It's a... Auto, auto documenting. Yeah, it's, it's, a, uh, it's basically a JSON describing the various endpoints of your API and what behavior they have on various methods. And uh, you, could, you could take a Swagger file and uh, use a tool called AutoRest. They have uh, their own version of it and uh, you could automatically generate bindings in your favorite programming language for each of them. Uh, it, still had some it still has some shortcomings though. Uh, it's pretty hard to switch, if you, especially if you have a million trillion cloud services in the old ASM API. Uh, ASM resources are still supported, which I find really bad because the API is bad, but they had to for the most part. Uh, as you saw, probably comparing, mentally comparing it to a heat template, the ARM template I showed you before was a lot longer. It's a little bit more verbose and more tedious to work with it, but it's still very much doable. Uh, like I said, the language bindings are auto-generated, so you're always, you're always using libraries for the latest and greatest API because they, they auto-generate them periodically. And it's still pretty early for it, so it's about a year old, and uh, not everything is fully documented. On a positive note, uh, Andrew Wilkins from the Juju core team uh, just recently added uh, ARM support to Juju, so now you can uh, deploy, deploy stuff on ARM with Juju. And uh, I lied a little bit at the beginning, I still have a sales pitch, but it must be a sales pitch for you guys. Uh, this, this is a pun, like, please let us help you with your Windows. <laughs> uh, we're here, we really believe that Juju deserves Windows and Windows deserves Juju, really. And, uh, <laughs> And uh, we'd really like to, to get in touch with you. We came here, we were really excited about all the reactive things, the layered things coming. And uh, we'd really like to, in the, in the next couple of days, we have, we'd really like to get a lot of work on that done. And we'd really like the Juju Core team to, uh, the, sorry, the Charms team to help us on that if need be, and vice versa. Also, if you happen to have any Windows and Juju related questions, please ask them to us or to. Uh, to us or to uh, the future folks, we will be more than happy to, to answer all your questions. And uh, thank you very much for listening. All right, thank you so much. Next up, we have Merlin speaking on Lexi on many providers, Juju on virtual wall. Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> uh, after that, we've got Gabby. Chew on up.
to the world. Windows Park in the border. Yeah, also. One person Windows Park. One person. Until there was a day. Is able to possibly do that. Mm -hmm. I was working also for my computer services. Okay. As an external, you know. In okay. the beginning days, beginning days. Did you have any people? Yeah, I have a cool project now with Max and Azure on there and some kind of part of supporting the objective is to make open source solutions available for Microsoft partners. Excellent. Redmine is a great project management mm -hmm. hmm? Red, Redmine okay, yeah, or, yeah. or WordPress is a great yeah. CMS. Yeah. But then on the Microsoft part, or mainly we don't have Linux knowledge. No. And that's, that's what you have like like It's point so point easy to use. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, but why? What is Microsoft's involvement? So they want to sell Azure. They want to sell running it on Azure. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't see the business model. <coughs> Just. Hmm? Uh, I don't know. I don't see. I don't see me or anyone outside Microsoft making money on Microsoft. It's just sort of a. Mm -hmm. If you sell it with Microsoft, then you rip off your customer. Just. I think you should be, uh, and then the customer pays 20 euro per so whatever. Hi, you I'm Merlin. And you I'm a researcher yeah. working yeah. on big data platforms. Um, I'm Galgash. Some people didn't know this until today. I changed my profile picture so people know that my land and Galgash are the same people. <laughs> and I have a blog where I write sometimes things. So, my research is mostly about big data platforms, and most of the product of this research is going into Tango. It's a big data platform that's currently uh, being incubated. Um, there's a startup being incubated around that platform, and so... <laughs> we, we want to make experimenting with big data easy, and getting into the big data field as easy as possible. And we use Juju at the core of this platform. So we are currently working on our own testbed. This is, this is like a mass, a mass-like testbed, which you can request servers, you say which image they have to be, you say how the networks has to be laid out, and you get that, you get that service. This is part of the European Fed for a Fire pro project. So you can use the same tools on all different testbeds over, uh, well, over the whole world. So I think this is my, yeah, this is my presentation. Yeah. So this is an example of a big data infrastructure that we can set up. So the, the data comes in in an enterprise service bus. This is just an API you can put, you can post messages to. This gets put into Kafka, and this gets pulled into the HDFS Hadoop using the Apache flu charms. Um, HDFS then can be used to, to query the data. Um, we also include Spark on it, so you can query the data using Spark. And then we have three interfaces on top of it. Q, which you can use to, to query data and to see the HDFS and to manage HDFS roles. Um, Apache Zeppelin, which you can use to query, and <coughs> the Spark, Spark notebook, which is like an IPython notebook, but for Spark. So how does this work in the back? <coughs> you see that most of these most of these services are running in containers, in containers on the machines. So the biggest problem we had here was, was that the Fed for Fire testbeds, they are not an official Juju provider. And it would be really hard to make them one, because the client is written in Java and it, it has a completely upside down way of asking resources. You basically, you ask resources and you say when these has to have to be released. And so after that time, the resources disappear. This is something that Juju cannot really, um, cannot really act with. Um, 
and so we had to use a manual provider. So we we writ, we've written a tool around Fusion, <coughs> and this tool. So this is this is the 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 uh, a user interface tool that you can use to request experiments from this this uh, federal firewall, the virtual wall, for example, and. We've written a, 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 a Python tool around Juju that first requests resources from the testbed, then takes that resources, then um, puts Juju on those resources and, and adds the machines manually. And then we have to enable containers on the manual provider. So we do that by um, first installing a DHCP, a DHCP server on a node that is going to be the, the gateway. And then we install a charm I wrote called LXC Networking that basically bridges the LXC BR1 interface of each server to an internal network. This means that when a container comes up and when, a, when Juju creates a container, it automatically assigns it, uh, connects it to the LXC BR1 interface. Because this interface is connected to the internal network where the DHCP server is, they get an IP address from the DHCP server. And so this way, all the LXC containers that are made in the experiment get an IP address automatically, an IP address that Juju can, can connect to. And so this way, we have LXC containers on a manual provider. So the, the thing you see here, so this is the internal network. This is like the, the, the data network. And then each node is also connected to a control network. So what we did previously was just use a control network, but the problem is that that is um, um, a company-wide network that has a company-wide DHCP server and that we, we cannot access and that has a limited set of IPs it can give. So we created our own network and we put our own DHCP server on it. And so the tool we wrote because the requesting resources takes very long, I'm not going to give you a live demo, but I started it a little while ago. So the first thing, you ask thank you, to create an experiment, and you, you supply it a bundle, a Juju bundle, which has some annotations in the machine section of that bundle, which describe which testbed you want the resources on, and whether or not you want a public IP or a private IP. So you create an experiment, this bundle first asks, uh, requests the experiment to the virtual wall infrastructure. Then it waits until that experiment gets online, is completed. Then it, uh, then it installs, a, uh, it runs a bunch of scripts that make the infrastructure a little bit saner because there are some weird quirks, weird quirks in the virtual wall infrastructure that have to be dealt with before Juju can run in it. And so here you see the last thing this tool does is, is, um, is reboot the infrastructure. And so here you see it's waiting until all the machines are rebooted again. So then we bootstrap the Juju environment. And then we start off by deploying the... <coughs> then we start off by deploying the DHCP server and the LXC networking charms. And we also add an open VPN infra server so that the administrators can connect to the internal network. And it also waits until everything is ready. And then it deploys the Juju bundle on top of it. So here you see a, a very dirty error. This is since lately because the layer charms cannot be co-located, cannot be Hulk smashed into a unit that contains a non-layer charm because of PIP. PIP stuff. The layer charms use Python 3, and so you use Python 3 PIP. And uh, non-layer charms think that PIP is Python 2 PIP. And so this is it. I did also want to mention that Corey just patched that problem for you. Yeah. Yes. It's just waiting for an end. But yeah, <laughs> no, so that a few of the people got to get it. So that's just like, so that's the last one. Cool. All right, we have one more presentation for lunch. Uh, so everyone's hungry with excitement, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. That white color. Perfect.
Uh, you have just VJ? Yeah, yeah, VJ. Oh, well done. Oh, we have VJ. Just keep pulling. No, 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 keep pulling. I see that. The last presentation we have is Gabby, who is going to be talking about how you write charts for Windows. Windows. Okay. I thought it said wives. Hmm? I thought it said charming with wives. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. I got, I got a little ambitious with the amount of space I had left. And I work primarily on Juju and Juju Core and Juju Charming for cloud based solutions. So, one thing will become painfully obvious this presentation was done in five minutes. So, I apologize for any, any graphical mishaps. So, so, we contributed uh, back in uh, 1.21. We wanted to be as close as possible to Juju uh, on Ubuntu. So we wanted people that uh, already is familiar on Ubuntu with Juju to just transition to Windows without any real problems in terms of using Juju. There are some things that are missing, such as debug hooks, because they heavily rely on Tmux and SSH, which does not exist in Windows at all. Um, there, should, there will be at some point some alternative to it, um, but not yet. WMI? WMI is an option. But for that, we need a uh, Go module to work across the network with WMI. And that is something that we are working on. There's a nice little project called Go Olay, which basically wraps uh, COM objects. And you can WMI over, over COM. So all that's needed is a small wrapper uh, on top of that COM module. And you get WMI. Uh, there's also no SSH in Windows. So Juju SSH won't work. Juju Run won't work. He's Isn't both. it going to be implemented? Do you do SSH? Um, SSH in Windows. Uh, it will be, but what do you do with uh, 2012, Windows 7, Windows 8, which... So these are all, all version of, versions of Windows that uh, traditionally get extremely long life cycles. So if you think of Windows XP that just died, thankfully. Um, but you're stuck basically on all systems without uh, open SSH. Uh, so this will uh, be implemented so in some other compiler. fashion on, uh, in Juju. For example, we can use the RPC uh, channel for things like Juju Run, which currently just SSHs over the network. There's no need for that, and if you think about it, it will benefit Ubuntu as well, as uh, OpenSSH versions and configurations will not matter anymore across uh, OS versions. So yeah, what's next for Juju on Windows? We want to implement Juju Run, remote Juju Run. So local Juju Run works over um, uh, named pipes, which are basically a combination of Unix named pipes and TCP sockets. You can have named pipes over the network. So uh, that works on local Windows. For remote Juju, we just want to use the RPC channel or why not the actions channel. Um, there will be at some point that when RM uh, channel in Juju that is able to basically yeah. manually provide uh, a Windows instance over the standard WinRM channel. It's basically a SOAP implementation where you can send yeah. commands over the network. Um, this also lets you have sessions, so we could uh, potentially write a small shell around this channel and allow something like Juju SSH over WinRM. So you can get that, you just Juju SSH in the same way as you would on any Ubuntu machine and you get a shell that is the normal PowerShell uh, uh, equivalent, basically, but in your local uh, shell. Yeah. Great. Great. Charming on Windows. So we've developed a bunch of PowerShell modules that allows you to uh, interact with Juju. They're called Juju PowerShell uh, modules. You can find them on GitHub. I'm going to get to that in a second. Uh, what they basically add is stuff like Juju get, uh, relation get, relation set, 
uh, all the goodies that you would get in Charm Helpers, uh, more or less. Um, we've wrapped them in PowerShell modules uh, that allow you to, uh, if you're familiar with PowerShell, just they're, they're going to seem perfectly familiar. Uh, we also have ad aliases for most of the stuff. So unit underscore get uh, relation underscore get relation set that is equivalent to the charm helpers you guys have. Um, this is the repository. So this, these are basically all the modules that uh, are included. You have uh, a true helper module that uh, gives you cross, cross windows version stuff like downloading a file. Surprisingly, they keep changing that. Uh, so, and there are various implementations of the same thing. Uh, invoke web request is one of them. Uh, start bits transfer is another way to do it. Uh, there's also a way to just call .NET classes and have that download the a file for you directly from .NET. So if you think about it, PowerShell is just a .NET wrapper that is easy to interact with. Uh, there's the Juju Hooks one that uh, adds all the goodies that interact with Juju. Uh, Juju logging, uh, we wanted a really small module to just to do logging in case we fail in the topmost uh, level of the charm. Juju utils gives you stuff uh, uh, like generate random string and stuff like this. Juju windows utils allows you to add windows users, add them to groups, uh, set privileges on users, and stuff like this. Networking allows you to do simple uh, net mass calculations if you need it. Uh, this is not easily done in PowerShell unless you do some magic. Uh, and there's a PowerShell YAML submodule, which is basically a, a small wrapper on top of a very nice library. It's called YAML.NET. And it allows you to uh, serialize power, simple PowerShell um, um, objects into YAML and back and, forth, back and forth. What is nice is that it also does some typecasting. So if you convert, uh, for example, a Boolean value to YAML, you get a true string. If you convert it back, you still get a Boolean value, not a string. So that's about it for the PowerShell. I can, I'll get into that more along the way. So these are the things I just talked about. PowerShell YAML, you can uh, find at that URL if you're interested. It contains only two exported functions, convert to YAML and convert from YAML. This is, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with PowerShell, but they have verbs, basically, that uh, approve verbs, uh, like convert to, convert from, start, invoke, stuff like this. If you don't use them, uh, PowerShell is going to complain that they might not be as discoverable as you uh, Discoverable from, from the command line. So this is a simple example of using the PowerShell YAML module. Uh, this is a way of doing multi-line uh, uh, strings. It's a simple YAML, and convert from YAML gives you this object. It's simple, it's easy. Uh, I find it a lot more preferable than using JSONs. Uh, Juju seems to agree. So <coughs> the default format is uh, YAML. And that's it for the slideshow, which was done in five minutes. Here we go. Uh, we have some help, uh, HTML help, that, you, that is present in the uh, Juju PowerShell um, repository. You have examples on how to use it. For example, the notorious Invoke Juju Reboot. We use it a lot. You guys, I don't think you even noticed it, right? I mean, who reboot you know. uh, <laughs> But we do that a lot. I mean, you move the cursor, you reboot. <laughs> uh, think of uh, Exchange, for example, it requires about four reboots to get uh, installed. And this helps us a lot. And you want to do that inside the context of the install uh, book most times. So what you do is uh, you usually do a Juju reboot now, which stops the hook at that point, reboots and requeues it for the next run. It start, starts up again, you do the item policy uh, checks, and you uh, pick up where you left off, continuing with your install logic. Uh, of course, every other uh, commandlet is documented. You have a set juju action fail, confirm juju relation, I'll get to that in a minute, juju master, uh, confirm juju master unit, basically does easily, easily there. Uh, there's an ADS to use master unit. You also have uh, in the juju windows utils, uh, start process as user. You guys know sudo, you know su, you like it, works. On Windows, it's a tricky bastard. <laughs> <laughs> so, you are an administrator, but you're not really an administrator. You have privileges that give you great granularity in terms of how, uh, what you can do and what you cannot do as an administrator. Think, think of um, GR security or hardened uh, Linux. 
uh, where you are root, but you're not root, unless you use some other user space to authenticate yourself. So what this does is uh, creates, it's all done in .NET in the background. There's a small assembly that, um, that we load in PowerShell. We do this because in uh, Nano Server, there are a lot of things that are missing. And uh, as opposed to the normal uh, Windows Server, Nano Server is about 200 megabytes. The normal Windows Server is 7 gigabytes. So stuff had to be taken up. Uh, this allows you to run Windows processes as another user. It's extremely useful when uh, trying to execute uh, a hook as a domain user in case you need it. This is the invoke fast web request. This works across platforms. You have examples right there on how to use it. So you, have, uh, you can use it on nano server, Windows, all versions of Windows. It does the right thing in the background, so you don't have to fiddle with that. There are other... Uh, so the other modules are also documented if you want to take a look. This is the repository. Oh, you might see stuff like this, which is probably creepy. So set user account rights is a tool that we use to grant the privileges that are needed to run those, run as a user or run as a service. To be able to run as a service under a different user, the user has to have the SE logon as a service right. And this is what you use to grant it. Uh, this is the PowerShell YAML uh, repository, if you guys want to take a look. If you want to test, uh, so this is a nice example of how we get the relation context on a window, in a Windows charm. Basically, you have the mandatory uh, required context based, uh, and an optional context. If, that, if there is any value that is null or uh, in that context, after you do the check for the relation information, the CTX variable becomes empty and you know that the context is not satisfied. The other two are optional, so it's, you treat it as you want, basically. Um, okay. If you want to deploy uh, one of our public and most complex deployments uh, of Windows Charms, this would be it. It's called Hyperconverge, Hyper-C. It deploys an OpenStack and a Google OpenStack with Hyper-V Hyper hypervisor attached on Nano server, um, we have a blog post about this, detailing how you can do this. Just go to cloudless IP slash I4C part two. It's a big article, make sure you have enough time to run it. And potentially enough resources. You have everything described in this article. I generate Windows images, yes. What's the advantage of running OpenStack on Windows instead of any other? Well, there are several. You've uh, you've run Windows instances on KVM before. So, in general, uh, if you run Windows instances on a KVM machine, there are a few aspects you need to think about. One is you need the virtio drivers. For for that, it's not included. For that, you have to go to either Canonical, Red Hat, or somebody else that built their own drivers and approved them in Microsoft. Uh, the Virtio drivers are not stellar, so you might get network outages, you might get blue screens. We've had that, so we pinned it to a version that uh, works for us most of the time. We have images bundled with it. And the second thing is licensing. So deploying a, KV, uh, a Windows instance on KVN requires you to license your instance. Whereas if you get a data, data center edition of Windows, um, that licenses the instances for you. So you only pay for the instance of the host, and the guests are automatically licensed to run. So if you have, for example, a dual CPU, 16-core uh, processors with half a terabyte of RAM, oh, sorry. No, you're going to wrap up. Just. Yeah. Uh, half a terabyte of RAM, you can spin up potentially tens, hundreds of instances on a single machine, and they are all licensed. Yeah. And so the, the first one, the drivers, are the, I don't really understand how, how it works. Mm. So KVM has, has to have drivers that Windows understands. Actually, Windows has to have the prior virtualized drivers, the <coughs> drivers, when running on KVM hosts. And not on... On Windows, no. They're baked into the kernel. The same way virtualized drivers are baked into the Linux kernel. So you don't need to install anything else. They're in there. Plus, and some people will get to pick their hypervisor, so we have to support it no matter what, right? Yeah. yeah. And also, the... Uh, so when the, uh, the Linux kernel also includes the, the Hyper-V power virtualized drivers. W uh, Microsoft was actually the biggest uh, kernel contributor uh, a couple of years ago. 
ironically, when they added the, the list, the Linux integrated systems to the kernel driver. So they were right up there, top. All right, any questions? Thanks. Awesome. All right, great, thanks so much. That's Lightning Talks for today.